Welcome back to what is a uh, mini segment of our video series that deals with loops. So far we've looked at uh, while loops, we've looked at do while loops, and now we're going to check out the for loop. So like any loop, it's used to execute some instructions a bunch of times. So maybe a hundred times, a thousand times, whatever we want it to. So, not, uh, so this while loop on the screen here um, counts from one to ten. I'm not going to go into too much detail because we've done plenty of these. But essentially, we begin with a value of one, we add one each time, and we keep doing that. We so we keep printing the value of count as long as count is less than or equal to ten. So we find that on the console, we'll get a um, count between one and ten like that. So we can refactor this as a for loop. Now, for loop um, has the same components as a while loop. So it has what's well, essentially the initial value. It has an increment. So that could be one, it could be minus one, it could be plus five, it could be whatever we want it to be. And it has a range. So in this instance, um, our range is one to 10. So we start at one and we stop when we get to 10. So in a for loop, we don't have them separated all over the place. So here we you know we have a, our initial value at the top, and we have a range within the condition of the while loop, and we have the increment within the body of the while loop. So it's, those three parameters are inside the parenthesis of a for loop. So I'm going to type in four, and then I'm going to put the initial value. So I'm going to put int, um, and I can't use count because counts up here. I'll just do something like hello. Int hello equals one. Then the range. So I want to print from one to 10 again. So I'm going to use that. So hello is less than or equal to 10, semicolon. And then the increment, hello plus plus. Once done, I'm going to hit the left brace, hit return. And just like the if statement, um, the right brace is automatically generated and this indent is placed in. Now, all that's left to do it's a system to out dot print ln with hello in the center. So hopefully you can see how the initial range, uh, initial value, sorry, and the range and the increment map from the while loop to the for loop. The great thing about a for loop is that's three lines of code, whereas a while that's five lines of code. All of the conditions, all of the parameters of the for loop are within this. Um, even within the parenthesis, that's quite neat. So if I just um, comment the while loop out, you should notice that um, this still counts from one to 10. There we go, just the same thing. So just to test understanding a little bit, so let's do three examples. Let's try to count from 10 to one in increments of one. So in the console, we expect to see 10, nine, eight, seven, six, so on and so on, till we get to one. We'll try that. Then we'll try counting from zero to 20 in increments of five. So we get zero, five, 10, 15, 20. And finally, we'll do one that deals with say from 100 to 70 in increments of two. So 100, 98, 96, 94, so on and so on and so on, till we get to 70. So we're gonna try and do these three examples. So these are the kind of questions that you probably will see in your Java exam. So count from 10 to one in increments of one. So minus one each time, as you can see. So if we look at our for loop, we've got three different parameters. So first of all, let's deal with the, the initial value. So our initial value here is 10. So that's going to be 10. I'll then suggest looking at the range, uh, sorry, the uh, increment. So the increment here is minus one each time. Now a shorthand for minus one, as you know, is minus minus. All that's left then is to deal with the range. So essentially saying that as long as hello is larger or equal to one, then we want this for loop to keep iterating. Okay, so the first loop, hello will be 10, 10 will be printed. We go back around, hello becomes nine because we minus one. That range is still true. So this will um, iterate, this will run again. Back around, hello becomes eight, 
because we drop one. This will execute. Background hello becomes seven because we drop one again and again and again until we get to the a point where hello is one. So when we see one on the console, the loop will go around once more. Hello will become zero and that range is no longer true. That condition is no longer true. So this line of code will not execute. So this should give us 10 to one with an increment of one each time. There we go, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and it stops. So of course, at the end of any loop, the program just continues. So if you put here, this is the end of the loop. Really can't type today. We should find that that appears at the end. So let's try the second example. Count from 0 to 20 in increments of 5. So the start value is always the easiest. So we start with 0. What's the increment? It's 5. So if you remember from your operators, plus equals 5 is what we require there. So then the range. Now let's have a look. So we start at 0. And we want it to continue looping as long as that value of hello is less than or equal to 20. So we flip that around. There we go. So hopefully you understand that logic there. So again, on our first iteration, hello is zero. So zero is printed console. We loop back around. Hello becomes five because we've incremented by five. So five is printed console. Loop once more. Hello becomes 10. Loop again. Hello becomes 15. Once more, hello becomes 20. Now the next loop, hello becomes 25. This condition is no longer met, so that's false. So this line of code is not executed. So we should end up with 20 and then the for loop should cease and we should get, this is the end of the loop printed to console. There we are, 0, 5, 10, 15, 20. This is the end of the loop. Final example, 100 to 17 increments of two. So again, the initial value is easy. Increments of two, so we get them down by two each time. So we're going to get minus equals two. Just about setting the range now. So this range is a little bit different because um, we're going down to 70 rather than zero. So we know we want 70 in there. Now, is this going to be less than or is it going to be greater than? Yeah, it's going to be greater than because 100 is greater than 70. So as long as the value of hello is greater or equal to 70, this loop will continue and it will continue to iterate down each time taking two from the value of hello. We run it and that's what we get. Da 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 da, 72, 70, which is what we want. This is the end of the loop. So I have a challenge for you. So the challenge is to produce this pattern of uh, seven stars each, well, five times basically, using two for loops. So we'll have an inner for loop and an outer for loop. Now that doesn't mean using something like this, where you just print out seven stars on a different line each time. It's about just using one system dot out with one star, okay? If you can do that, fantastic. Please proceed to the next video, and um, if not, Hang around and I'll show you a solution. Good luck. Welcome back. Okay, so we can split this problem into two components. So the first component is the logical side of it. You know, so it's figuring out what steps we need to create this pattern. 
um, in terms of you know how many stars in a row, how many times does it repeat, and so forth. And the second component is to get into Eclipse and try to actually code um, a scenario where we'll have this pattern to console. Okay, so let's go for the logical side first. So there are two features to this pattern. The first feature is the fact that we have seven stars in a row. So I'm going to put here, print seven stars in a row. Great. And the second feature is the fact that we have seven stars repeated five times. So our next step is to repeat step one five times. Now at some point in here we're also going to have to deal with the fact that we have a carriage return as well between the first set of stars and the second, but we'll get to that. So that's the logic. Now let's switch to Eclipse and um, try to code at least the first step, which is to print seven stars in a row. Okay, so to do this, we want to execute the same piece of code seven times. Okay, so what we don't want to do is system dot out dot print one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I mean, that will give us what we want. But if you remember from the beginning of the video, we're only allowed to use one star. So that means that we need to repeat this line of code seven times, four, five, six, seven, which will give us the same result. Now we know that when we repeat code, we can use a loop to um, make it more efficient. So instead of doing seven of the same line, we're going to use a loop to execute this line of code seven times. For that, we'll use a for loop. So I'm going to put four, and then we'll set up a, an integer, let's call it count, start at one. And we're going to increment by one each time. I'm going to set the range. So we want to go to seven. So we're going to so count is smaller than or equal to seven. Okay, and let's put the body in, and then we can do our system out dot print and a single star. Okay, so that should give us seven stars. We start at one, we add one each time to count, and we stop. Well, we keep looping as long as count is less than or equal to seven. So that should give us seven stars. And there they are. Note, there's no LN there, because if we did that, then these stars would be on different lines. We don't want that. We just want them to be in the same line. So we've dealt with step one. So we could call this the inner for loop. So this is all good. Let's make that green. Sort it. So the next bit is to repeat step one five times. So again, what we could do is just do that five times. Okay, that looks okay. Um, kind of would work, but again, we're just repeating code over and over. When we repeat code over and over, we can use a loop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to nest this for loop, which we'll call the inner for loop, inside another loop, which we'll call the outer for loop. So I'm going to just indent just a little bit and I'm going to build a loop around it. Okay, so I'm going to put four. I'm going to put int. Um, we use the hello this time instead of count because we count down here. And we'll count up to five. Now you've noticed that, and if I put a gap here you'll see this a bit clearer. That I've simply put our inner for loop within the body of our outer for loop. So as this increments from 1 to 5, just as a normal for loop does, it will execute this inner for loop five times over. Okay, so on the first iteration, you know, when hello equals 1, that'll run, give us seven stars, loops back up, hello um, increments by 1, so it becomes 2. That's executed again. We go around again. Hello becomes three. That's still within the conditions of our range. So this inner for loop will execute once more. Again, giving us another seven stars. We go up. Hello becomes four. Another seven stars. Hello becomes five. Another seven stars. Then hello becomes six. Now at that point, that's out of the range of our for loop. So this inner for loop will not execute. 
So at that point, um, the for loop, the outer for loop will cease. And we can have, say, printed here. This is the end of the pattern. There we go. So let's run this and see what happens. Ah, okay. So what you can see what's happened here. There's no carriage returns. So we've hit, you know, we've made our seven stars. That's fine. So that's our first lot of seven stars. Our second lot, our third lot, our fourth lot, and our fifth lot. And then this is the end of the pattern. But we've, we've you know, we've got no carriage returns. So where's the best place then to put this carriage return? Is it in here? I'm going to go in there. I'm going to put it up here. So you're going to go down here. Where's it go? Give yourself a moment to figure that out. Okay, well, the logic is this. If you think about the pattern that we've got here, we have our seven stars. Okay, that's uh, created by the inner for loop. And then we have the carriage return. Then the second lot of seven stars, then a carriage return. Third lot of seven stars, a carriage return, and so forth. So it makes no sense to put it within the for loop, because if we did, we'd just end up with each star on a different line. So if our inner for loop here creates the seven stars, we want to add a carriage return just after. Then next time we go around, the seven stars should be printed on a new line. And there we are. Seven, 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 all on new lines. Now note that our carriage return here is created just by doing a system.out.println, but with nothing in the parenthesis. Okay, so that's quite, quite a useful thing to know. So now we've got our seven stars repeated five times. Of course, if we want to repeat it more times, we could just change the range of our outer for loop, so we could make it 10. That gives us seven stars 10 times. Change it back to five. Or we could have more or less stars in the inner for loop. So if we just want two stars in each line, drop that to two, we just get two stars. If we want 50 stars in each line, we can do it. So this inner for loop determines how many stars we want printed in a row. Then we have a carriage return. And the outer for loop determines how many times we want to repeat that pattern across our new lines. So there might be a point when you're programming where you need to deal with a large set of data. So for example, um, all the students in Basketball University have a student number. Um, I mean, that's about 8,000 pieces of data. Now, instead of making individual variables for each student, it makes sense to kind of package all of those numbers, because they all will be whole numbers, integers, into a big box full of integers. It's much cleaner, and it saves um, on writing lines of code. So for example, if you look here, um, I've made 10 variables, uh, student A, student B, student C, and so forth, each with a valid student number. That's 10 lines of code. But what I could do is make one, something called an array, that holds these 10 pieces of information instead. So we can still access these numbers using the techniques that I'm going to show you in a, in a few minutes. But the point is here, instead of 10 lines of code, we can write that with one line of code. Okay, so an array has two components, uh, the array itself, which we can consider as a box or a container, and the individual piece of data within the array, which we'll call values. So what I'm first going to do within Eclipse um, is generate an array. And there's two ways to generate an array. You can generate an array which is empty and then add the values in one by one. Or you can actually generate the array and initialize it with all the values in just one single line of code. So I'm going to show you both approaches. So approach number one we can consider as kind of the, the long method, um, which is creating the array, 
and adding values one by one. So this is how we do it. So an array has um, several components. Firstly, it, um, it has a data type. So our, our arrays will be either integers, or they could be doubles. They could contain doubles. They could contain strings, so that's um, words or sentences. And we could have an array of characters, so that's chars. Or we could have an, uh, an array of Boolean values, so trues or falses. What we're going to create today is some integers, so an integer array. So to do that, we need to define the type, the data type of the array first. So I'm going to type in int, and then I'm going to use the square brackets. Now, the square brackets are kind of pretty much reserved for arrays. So um, we have a left square bracket and a right one to start with. And this, dis, um, this denotes that what we're making here is an array of integers. Now, just, when you, just like when you create a variable, you'll need to give it a name. So I'm going to call mine student numbers then equals and then I'm going to type in new and then int again square brackets and within the square brackets I want to um, define how many values I want my array to hold so if I'm going to make this array here I've got one two three four five six seven eight nine ten values so simply in that square box within the uh, the brackets there, I'm going to put 10. And there we are. So this section is creating an array. So this line of code, you've created the array, but you've added no values to it. So just to recap, we're defining an array. That's going to hold integers. We're going to call that array student numbers. And we're going to initialize it with 10 empty slots, essentially. So the next step is to add a value to the array. Now, an array works like this. We work with something called indexes. So we can point to any particular space in the array via something called an index. So if we want to access this first slot in our array, um, we can say, right, I want to add 10 to index 0. If we want to add 40 here at this point, in this slot of the array, we can say I want to add the value 40 to index 6 of this array. So this is the uh, this is the method within um, within um, Eclipse. So firstly, I need to select the array which I want to work with. So it's going to be student numbers. Then I'm going to select the index that I want to fill. So square brackets and put a zero inside. So now I basically what I've done there is I've selected this first box at index zero. What I'm now going to do is add 10 into that box. You do that simply by equals and then 10. Just like that. So we can do the others. So in index one, which is going to be the second box in our array, we can put 15. And so forth. So at index two, we put 20. Index 3 sits 25. Index 4 is going to be 30. And so on. Let me just pop all these in. Then we can continue. There we go. So you'll note that, and it's probably better to be viewed on here, that the last box in our array of 10 values is actually index 9. So that's because we start index 0 here and move up by 1 each time to get to index 9. So although there are 10 values, that top index is 9. And that's because we start at 0 rather than 1. It's a little bit annoying because um, you will inevitably forget um, initially that the first value of any array is index 0. Most people will naturally think it's index 1, but it's index 0. So now what we've done essentially is we've created an array with 10 empty slots and for every one of those slots we've um, initialized it with a value, we've assigned a value here. So our third index, which is slot 4 essentially, now has 25 in it. 
So the next thing we want to do is just test whether this works. So we want to print out a particular slot in our array. So I might want to print out this, whatever's in this slot here, which we know to be index four. It's quite simple to do this. System dot out dot print ln as you'd expect. Nothing new here so far, but it's what we put within these parentheses that's important. So we want to access a particular index of the array student numbers. So I'm going to type in student numbers and then select the array which and the sorry the index that I want. So we want this index here, so index four. Great. So what we're hoping to see on the console then is 30 printed. And there it is, because we've accessed index four of the array student numbers. So let's try to access index eight of the array student numbers. So we're looking for 50 on the console. If I type in eight there, hit run, there it is. So as I say, that's the long method. Now actually, when you look at this, this saves no code. If we wanted to create um, 10 integers, we'd actually find that we used one more line of code than if we just said int student a equals 10, etc, etc. So that doesn't save as much time and much space, but there is a way to do it shorthand. Now the shorthand method is, is simply this. It starts exactly the same, so we declare an integer array we can call it um, student numbers two. I can't use the same one because of course that's student numbers. I need to give this a separate name. So student numbers two equals as you'd expect. Now instead of writing new and int and creating empty gaps for the array, I'm going to just populate it with some values. So you'll use a left brace here and a right brace, semicolon, and then the values go within the two braces. So I could put 10, I usually forget there, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, and 55. So that should be 10 values, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That's all good. Now these still have the same index numbers as you'd expect. So this first value here is index 0 index one, index two, and so on until index nine. And we access to print um, these index numbers in exactly the same way as we did here. So system.out.print ln student numbers two, because now we're dealing with this array, and say we want to print out the first value here. A zero would go within that box. Okay, student, ah, missed the S there, that's why. Student numbers two, student numbers two, and a zero. So I hit run, and we should see 10 at the bottom there. To be clear, I can put student numbers, student number one, or index zero, equals. Okay, so I'm concatenating um, the print statement here by adding some text at the beginning. So we should get student number index zero equals 10. Could do another print statement to, to print out the last value, which would be index nine. Place a nine there, index nine there. And there you go, 55 appears. Now if you try to print out, and I'll just do this quickly here, if you try to print out something which is out of the range of the array. So we know this only goes up to index nine we try to print index 10, which doesn't exist, note what happens in the console here. Okay, so it'll print everything we've asked it to, but when it gets to this line of code, we'll receive an error. And this says array index out of bounds. So if you're ever um, programming something to do with arrays, um, particularly you'll find this error comes up in loops a lot when um, the incorrect numbers are used for the range. And this exception comes up when you say uh, range index out of bounds, you pretty much know that you've ended up using a number which is out of the array scope here. So it's too far. So 10 is no good in this exception. And of course, minus one will not work either because 
there is no index minus 1. We start at 0 and we end at 9. So we can keep increasing the length of the array. Um, could go to add some more values here. That's perfectly fine. And then we can use the print statement to print these further indexes. So the last one now will be index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So I put 13 in there. I should get 75 in the console. And there you have it. So um, that's a brief introduction to arrays, how to create them using the long method. So that's um, basically declaring them and initializing them with no values uh, to start with, and then adding the values in one by one. Or the shorthand method, where you will um, declare the array and add all the values during the initialization phase, so right at the beginning. So that's one line of code there, saves all of that lot, having to do that. And then we've also looked at how to print out particular indexes of the arrays. In the next video, we'll um, use um, for loops to loop through all of the index um, positions of the array. Um, and we'll also look at how to define what that last one is. So we can, um, we can use a piece of code which tells us the length of any particular array. So try and make your own arrays and see how you get on. Best of luck. In my last video, Array the Basics, we learned four things about an array. So we understood what it was. So we understood it's a collection of values, whether that's a collection of integers or doubles or strings or characters. We also um, looked at how to add values to an array. We also looked at the index system. So for example, um, here, this first value is index zero. This next value is index one this next value is index 2, and so on. We also looked at how to print particular indexes of any array. So this line of code here shows us how to print the index 0 of the array, which we have called sentence here. So of course, doing that is going to print the letter A. So what we're going to do today, we're going to do two things. We're going to um, iterate through an array. So how do we you know, um, grab every single value within our array um, to either print or do something else with. And also how to determine the length of an array using um, a line of code. So the first thing we're going to do is iterate through an array. So on the screen at the moment I've got a string array. It's called sentence and it's initialized with six values. So it's a bit of a random sentence that I grabbed offline of a random sentence generator. It says a fuzzy snake ate the cloud. So we've got six different values, six strings here. The first string is a, next string is fuzzy, next string is snake, and so forth. So to print every value in that array, we could do this. Um, <clears throat> very familiar. So this is printing the first index, well, index zero, then index one, then index two, all the way down to five, which is our final index there. This would work. So if I hit run, you see the entire um, array, each element printed on a new line. A fussy snake ate the cloud. Of course, when we have very long arrays, um, maybe of 100 values, this method is quite slow because we have to write many, many lines of code. So instead, and when we find we have lots of repeating code, we use um, a loop. So we can use a loop to do this job for us in minimal code. So to do this, um, we can use a for loop. So if you're not familiar with for loops, look um, back at some of the other videos in this series and you'll see how to use them. But essentially what we're going to do is print out each value here in the array based on its index. So actually what we need to do is create a for loop that counts from zero to five. Okay. You'll see why it's 0 to 5 in just a moment. So what we're going to do is we're going to make that for loop. 
So we need to declare some kind of integer within our for loop. Let's call it count. Start at zero because that's the first value that we're trying to create here, zero. We go into count up basically to five. So the loop is going to continue to iterate until we get to five. So as long as count is smaller or equal to five, then the loop will continue. Of course, we want to count up by one. As you can see here, zero, one, two, three, four, five is an iteration of one each time. So then we produce the code body. So our two braces, just as normal. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to put system dot out dot print ln. And then we want to put sentence because that's the array that we're working with. And in here, I'm going to put count. So what's actually happening here is we're starting count at zero. Zero is then being basically passed into here. So instead of count, we'll see zero like this, which we know just like this is going to print out the word A. On the next iteration of the for loop, count will increase by one because of this. So count becomes one. This line of code here will essentially be this. So sentence one is fuzzy. The next iteration of the loop count becomes two. So of course sentence becomes, uh, becomes sentence two here and snake is printed to the console. So you can see what's happening here. Essentially we are moving through the array using a for loop. So let's do that. I'm gonna to put to the beginning of here um, for loop just so we see the difference between what's printed um, in these six lines and what's actually printed for the for loop. So for loop concatenate that. So let's see what happens. There we go. So A, fuzzy snake ate the cloud. Okay, so I'm just gonna delete these lines of code here just to save confusion. I want to consider this scenario. We're making a web application and that web application pulls in data from a database. So the data that's been pulled in is a load of words, so lots of strings. Those strings have been fed into an array, um, say sentence, called sentence. But the thing is we don't know how many words have been pulled in from the database. They could be six, just as though I hear. They could be a hundred, they could be a thousand words. We have no idea. So the problem that we face is we're gonna find it very difficult to write a for loop and essentially set the range properly. So this number five, of course, won't work if I put, if there are a couple more words in, so more, if I put more words, and try to run this for loop, you'll see that they don't appear here. So we've got a bit of an issue. Now, luckily, there's a really good way to determine how many um, values are in an array. And that's using dot length. So dot length essentially just tells us how many values we have. So in this we have six, but we may have more. So to count how many values in any particular array, we just need to put the array name. So sentence in this uh, case, and then dot length. And that will save the value six. So we need to save it somewhere. So I'm gonna save it in a new variable. Let's call it array length. Semicolon at the end. So what we should have here then is um, integer array length should be initialized with the value of sentence dot length, which we know to be one, two, three, four, five, six. If I add another word here, then sentence dot length is going to be seven and array length is going to be seven. Now just to kind of prove that, if I do a system dot out dot print ln and put array length equals then plus array length should get seven printed here. There we go. So of course we could ditch that line of code and instead of putting array length here, we could just put sentence dot length. That would work just as fine. And you'll see here we get exactly the same result. So it's the sentence dot length which is really important. So we could place this sentence dot length within our for loop to make sure that we count up um, all the way through, we iterate all the way through the array. Now, if we put directly sentence.length in here, 
um, we're going to see a problem. And I'm just going to, yeah, okay. If I run it, you'll see, you'll see what happens. So we end up being out of bounds. So word does come up, but it seems as if we're trying to access um, an index or well, the next index. So if there was another word here, it's trying to access that one, but of course it doesn't exist. And this is because we're counting from zero to sentence start length. Now sentence start length, as we well know, is seven. So counting from zero to seven is bad because there isn't index seven in our array. So we only go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's index zero. In fact, that's index six. So it's a little bit tricky, and you know, got to be aware of that. Um, easiest way to do it is just get rid of the equals. So we're saying we count from zero. We count as long as count is less than sentence dot length. So as soon as we get to seven, this for loop will not um, run the body, uh, code within this body. So that should work now. Let's try it. There we go. So we we end at word. Now the beautiful thing about this is we can just keep adding more words. So more words are added. And it's a case of just running it and they will appear. Simple as that. So we'll do one more example. Let's do it with integers. So we make an int array. We'll call it, um, I don't know, let's call it results. So let's say that this application is pulling in a load of um, test results again from a database, but we don't know how many test results it's going to um, pull in. So for now, it's put like just a few in. Poor person got 34, but this one an i7, good on them. Uh, 50, 76, 75, okay. Now don't even try to count them, it doesn't matter. So let's go for the um, process of iterating through the array. So for loop, int, let's use count. Again, you can use anything you want. We start at zero, because the first index we want to print is index zero. Then I'm going to put count is less than results dot length and then count plus plus. And then the body here, we're going to put system dot out dot print ln results and then in our square brackets, I'm going to put count. Hit run, and there they all are. So starting at zero, so that's index zero, and ending just before, one value before we get to results.length, which in this case is actually two, three, four, it's actually seven. So this will count from zero to six. And there we are, they're all on there. So make your own arrays, um, throw in some values, and use this for loop system with dot length um, method there to iterate through an array. Good luck. These next three videos are going to be about methods. So in the first video, I'm going to talk about what a method is and show you how to write a simple one. Um, and in video two, I'm going to be talking about and showing you how to pass values into a method. And on video three, it's going to be about um, extracting or returning data or values from a method. So first of all, what is a method? I suppose one of the easiest ways to understand and think about a method um, is as a block of code which does a particular job. So for instance, if you look at this method, which I've called print hello world, its job is to print the word hello, and then on the next line, print the word world. So that method is all wrapped up there in, in um, some, some words we don't know yet, public static void, um, and within some braces. So this, what's highlighted here, is the method itself. Now we can run or to use the correct terminology, invoke that method somewhere in our program. 
So you can see up here we have a line which says print hello world and then some parenthesis uh, open and close and then a semicolon. What this line does is look for a method with the name print hello world. Once it's found it, it runs, executes the code within that method, within the braces. So to understand how to write a method, we need to understand its construction a little bit. And to do that, I'm just going to flip over to this program here, which is our, um, which is just a simple hello world, which has only our main method in. So looking at this kind of default, what we have is a class which wraps up everything that we want to code. Uh, we make our class, we can call it whatever we want. I've called it default. So this is nothing new. We do this every single time that we want to make um, a new program. And then you'll notice that within that class, there's something called public static void main. So actually, this is a method. This is a method called main. And this is what the Java compiler will look for, this main method, when um, we run the program. It'll look for main and then start to execute the code within main. Now, flipping over to our other program, you'll notice we still have that class, which in this case is called methods. We still have that main method there, but underneath it, we have a new method which we've created. So the point is here that when we make new methods, when we write new methods, we write them outside of the scope of the main method. So it doesn't go within it like this, like that. It goes outside of it, it goes underneath it, just there. So if you wanted to write another method, We'd simply put it underneath too. And then we can change it and do whatever we want. So we've seen this method, we know what it does. I'm going to delete it. I'm going to make another method which does a similar job. So we're going to make a method which prints four numbers to the console. So what we're going to do, we're going to type in public static void. Now, for now, I don't worry about public and static. It's not really relevant. We, all the methods that we make over the next three videos are going to start with public and static. What these, what these terms mean is a little out of the scope of what we need to deal with right now. But what we will look at is the word void. Now, what void means is this method doesn't return any values back to the main method. It does a job, and that's it. Now, you'll see in video three, for instance, that we can return integers or doubles or strings or whatever we want from this method back to the main method. And when we do that, this word void will be replaced by int or double or string. But for now, we'll stick with void. So the next step then is to determine a name for our method. So this method is just gonna print some numbers. So it makes sense to call it something like print numbers. Noting that we use camel case again uh, for this. So print, of course, is lowercase, and then the second word numbers, the first letter, is um, capitalized. Next thing to do is open parenthesis and close parenthesis, and our curly brace on the left, hit return to automatically generate our right brace. I'm gonna leave a bit more room there. And then I'm gonna do a system dot out dot print ln and start to put some numbers in. So I'm just going to print out one, two, three, and four. So you can see our method here, which we've called print numbers, is going to print the number one, then the next line print the number two, on the next line the number three, and finally on the next line number four. So the only thing left then to do is to invoke the print numbers method somewhere else in the code. So we're obviously going to do that in the, the main method here. So I'm going to type print numbers, open close parenthesis, and then semicolon. And what this is going to do then is look for the method called print numbers and execute the code within that method. Let's see if it works. And there you have it. So that's a simple introduction to methods. Um, what they are, how to write a simple one, noting that the method itself has to be underneath the main method, not within it. And we also talked about 
you know, how to correctly name our methods so we understand what they do. So join us in the next video. I'm going to talk about how to pass values into methods so we can do more interesting things with them. Consider this application I've uh, got loaded up here. So this is a comparison application, so it compares two integers um, saved as two variables, first number and second number. And if they're the same, of course, you know, we'll have numbers match printed to console. Otherwise, we have numbers don't match printed to console. So the, the goal of this video is to refactor this code. So um, the comparison part is its own method. We can call that method something like compare numbers. Then what we want to try and do is feed these numbers into the method. So that's called passing. Pass these numbers into the method so that we can um, do the comparison within the method. Now we have an understanding of what this uh, program is supposed to do. I'm going to delete what we already have and then write a new method. So this method is going to do the comparison for us. Um, we'll call it compare numbers, I think. So to start with, I'm going to type in public and static. Again, don't worry about that. That's going to be the same for all the methods that we create over the next couple of videos. I'm then going to type void. I type void instead of something like int or double or string because I don't want to return any values from this method just yet. So void is what we're going to use. I'm then going to type the method name which is going to be compare numbers. Left and right parenthesis, and then some curly braces, and a bit of room. So of course normally when you invoke that method, you would write compare numbers, parenthesis again, and semicolon. So we're going to pass some numbers. So I'm going to put, just for now, I'm going to put 6 and 8 in there. Let's ignore the error for now, but what the goal is essentially is to pass these numbers, which we're trying to compare, into this method. Now to do that, we need to set up some kind of temporary or holding variables that hold these values. Now you do that within the parenthesis of the method itself. So I'm going to type in int and then any kind of variable name which makes sense. So let's go for first number. So this variable here is going to temporarily store that 6. Now we have two values here, so we want to add another variable. We can do that with a comma. So again, int, something that makes sense, second number. There we go. The errors go away, which is good. So what's essentially happened is these numbers, these values, have been stored temporarily within these two variables. We can then use these variables here um, for the comparison. So I'm going to put an if statement within my method now. So I'm going to go if first number is equal to second number um, system dot out dot print ln these numbers match. Otherwise or else these numbers do not match. There we go. So just to recap what's actually happening here, we've created a method which essentially does our comparison for us here. You'll notice how similar this is to the, the first example that I had um, at the beginning of the video. We then evoke that method and we pass in two numbers, the numbers that we want to be compared. Those numbers are stored temporarily here and we use those stored variables, those variable names, as the things that we're comparing. So first number is equal to second number is basically saying 6 is equal to 8. So let's execute that code and there we go. The numbers do not match. 6 does not match 8. So first number being 6 is equal to second number being 8. That's not a true condition. So that doesn't run. 
Hence that line of code runs. Now the beauty of this is we can just keep doing those comparisons because this is now its own separate little entity. We can just keep putting different comparisons in. So let's do 8 compared to 8, 100 compared to 50, and say 2000 compared to 2000. So we should have these numbers do not match, these numbers match, these numbers do not match, and these numbers match printed to console, each on their own separate line. Run the code, and that's what we get. OK, well, what if we want to do something a bit more complicated? Perhaps we don't want to just pass in two numbers, but we want to pass in a range of numbers. Well, we can do that too, simply by extending what we have here. So I'm going to begin another um, kind of program that's going to add a couple of numbers up. So well, no, we'll add, uh, say, four numbers up. So we start in exactly the same way. We create the, uh, create the method. So public static void. Again, not returning any numbers. We'll call it sum numbers because that means adding up numbers. Um, there you go. And then we'll evoke it. So I'm going to put some numbers there. So all good so far. Then we'll start thinking about how many numbers we want to add up. So we can add up four. Let's add up the numbers two, four, six, and eight. So we've put four numbers as kind of parameters of our sum numbers invocation. So because there's four numbers, we need to have four temporary variables, which are going to hold those numbers. So again, int, let's use first number again. int second number, int third number, and int fourth, no we're using it, fourth number, there you go. Okay, so we'll do the, uh, the, the maths here. So what we'll do is we'll store the calculation as a new variable. So let's put int calculated number equals First number plus second number plus third number. This is a lot of typing plus fourth number. Just like that. And then we can do system done out dot print calculated number. So I'm just expand this a little bit so we can see what's happening. So the logic should be fairly straightforward here. We have created a method which is going to take four numbers. And it's going to add them all up, store it as a new variable, be called a uh, called calculated number, and then we're going to print that new variable to the console. We're going to evoke the sum numbers method up here, and we're going to pass in the four numbers, which are going to get stored temporarily to these four variables and so forth. So two, four, six, eight, run that, and we get our calculation here. And of course, we can, if we want to add another number to that chain, say ten, it's just a case of adding another variable. I'm going to be blank then, I'll spell fifth. Uh, so there you go, fifth number, and then just add it to our chain. Simple as that. So add that, that should end up with 30. There you go. So it's very quite easy to extend these. And yet again, you can use that, um, evoke some numbers once more, and put some different values in. It'll do the calculation. Uh, let's put them on separate lines so it's clearer. There you go. So 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10 summed will give us 30. 3, 5, 6, 9, and 20 summed will give us 43. So we've made a little calculator function here, a very simple one.